Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday morning service. We're so glad you're here. We're going to begin our service by singing our opening chant, One with the One. morning. <clears throat> we are delighted that you have joined us in person or via Facebook Live and Zoom. And for those of you who are here in person, please be sure to silence your cell phones. And for those of you at home, no scrolling. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so thank you. And uh, we're delighted that you are all here. So let's just join together in prayer for just a moment. We join together knowing that we are divinely connected, that this community comes together in the spirit of oneness, of love and compassion and understanding. We come here knowing that this service today is absolutely blessed. And whatever it is we need to receive today through the music, through our wonderful Reverend Sidney, and through all of the energy and vibration of each of us in this sanctuary and each of us with us from Zoom and Facebook in our virtual community, we know that we are divinely blessed. We know that spirit blesses each and every single one of us as we are separate in physical form, but one in the mind of spirit. So I just say thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you for every day and thank you for this beautiful community. And I just release my word and I say thank you. And so it is and together we say amen. Thank you. 
I invite us all to rise and join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. Amen. And now let's join in singing our congregational song, Amazing Grace. <laughs> Now we are going to meditate for the next five whole minutes, so I invite everyone to close your eyes and silently repeat the mantra, God's the love that I am. If your mind wanders, just bring it back to silently repeating, God's the love that I am, and I will bring us out of meditation in five minutes.
Take the silver lining, keep it in your own sweet head. Shine it when the night is burning red. Shine it on the twilight, shine it on the cold. Shine until these walls come tumbling down. Cause you were born with our eyes wide open, so alive with wild hope now. Can you tell me why time after time we let them drag? Down in the darkness deep Fools in the madness all around Know that the light don't sleep Step into the silence Take it in your own two hands Scatter it like diamonds all across this land. Place it in the morning, wear it like an iron skin. Only things worth living for is innocence and magic, amen. Time and let them drag us down, down in the darkness so deep. Fools in the madness all around. They know that the light don't sleep. When the night will it's burning red Shine it on the twilight Shine on the cold ground Shine it till these walls Come tumbling down I say fools in the madness all around. They know that the light never sleeps. Fools in the madness all around. Know that the light don't sleep. Ooh. Ooh.
The light in the darkness never sleeps. The light in the darkness never sleeps. That's such a powerful, powerful idea. It takes the light to pierce and define the darkness. It's not the other way around. The darkness doesn't define and, and pierce the light. We can't bring darkness to this beautiful room and say, oh, that's it, we're done. <laughs> um, there's a story about a construction crew in the last century, middle of the last century, they were hired to go move a big, and when I say big, I mean really, really big, like 300 foot tall, massive stone Buddha. And this was in Thailand. Now, there was much concern and much uh, negotiation about how are we going to do this? This thing is huge, we don't wanna break it. It's clay, it's stone, it's been shaped, it's been carved. It's absolutely spectacular. So they, they did all the math and they got the cranes in and they got it all ready to go. And then they went, okay, rain tonight, let's cover it up and we will start fresh tomorrow to move this into a spot where it will stay safe and where we can preserve it and if we need to restore anything, it will be perfect. So the head of the crew woke up at about four or five in the morning to the sound of rain and he grew concerned about this. He thought, wow, I want to make sure that we fully covered the Buddha so that no damage comes to this precious artifact, which was undeniably centuries old. So he went out to the site to check on the Buddha, and he did indeed see where some of the covering, some of the tarp had come away. And as he looked, he saw that there was something shiny within there. And he thought, well, that's very interesting. And he rubbed a little bit, and he rubbed a little bit more, and he rubbed a little bit more, and indeed, the water, the rain, had begun to wash the clay away from this 350-foot tall, solid gold Buddha. The light in the darkness never sleeps. So it got me thinking. And, and the story behind this apparently is that hundreds of years before, there, were, um, there was an army from what was then Burma that came to attack this particular uh, province and the monks covered the Buddha so that it would be safe, knowing that the, 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 the enemy troops would, would say, oh my gosh, 350 feet of gold, let's take that, melt it down and, and I don't know, make jewelry, make shoes, <laughs> I, whatever. And so they covered it up. Now, the, everybody in the, the monastery was, was slaughtered in this invasion, yet the Buddha survived. So I thought about this when I first heard this story years ago, and I thought, there's, there's so much truth in this because we all tend to, at least I'll speak for myself, I walk around sometimes covered and my light doesn't shine the way it could. And I, it might peek through little cracks here and there because I'll forget that within that I am pure light. But sometimes over the course of our lives, we have gathered cover, we have gathered mud or clay to protect us, or we have taken on the beliefs and the comments of other people who have perhaps said, you're not enough. Your light is too bright. Oh, don't shine here. Whatever it is, we don't want it. Whatever you're offering. And so we take on this stuff. And I believe that part of what we are called to do, and this is why this teaching is so powerful, is to begin to look at those areas where we need to do some spiritual exfoliation. Where do we need to let that dust go, that mud go, those beliefs go? Where are those areas in which uh, we've accepted what somebody else said and we've buried our light? We've buried our light. You know, we do this, and it's so easy to do. I, I have thought about this when I was a child. I remember times when I was excited and wanted to come out and, and show my family, my parents, um, my uncle, my aunt, about the new song I had learned on piano. And I remember my uncle sitting there saying, how long do we have to listen to this? There's a layer of mud. Or a teacher in fifth grade who 
said, well, you know, we could, we could cast, she told my girlfriend this, we could cast Sydney in a play, in this, this little class play we're doing, but I don't think she's reliable enough. Another layer of mud. So those are some ideas that I lived with for a while that somebody else gave me. They plastered that crap on me, and I went, okay, I'll take this clay as my own, forgetting that there's a light inside there, and it's pure light. You and I are pure light beings. Now, today I happen to be wearing a really, really pretty purple scarf over my pure light being, but we are all pure light beings walking around in skin, in clothes. But how many of us remember or got up this morning and say, looked in the mirror and said, I am pure light, baby. Look at me. Most of us looked in the mirror and said, oh, my God, really? <laughs> really? So there's a paradigm that this brings to mind for me, and it's, it's a wholeness paradigm. The wholeness paradigm is that we are already whole. We are already light. We are already that. And yet, until we begin to live into the vision of that, we won't experience it. We will not be living according to that paradigm. It's almost as if we live according to a parallel paradigm of not being good enough, of not being whole, of not being light, or maybe just being some light, right? Like we're diffused or something. And that's where this exfoliation has to come in, where we begin to use spiritual principle and truth to rinse away, to rub away whatever it is those ideas were that were covering us up. In fact, for many of us, it's a bursting through, and it cracks that dryness. It cracks that clay, right? It, it, it's, I'm trying to think of a, of a metaphor of coming from the earth, you know, something that, well, holy cow, a flower breaking through the crust that comes into the world and shines. You know, we've all seen that flower that makes its way through the sidewalk, the concrete of the sidewalk. It will not be denied. And you and I, once we know that there's a possibility or there's, a, there's something inside us, a restlessness that starts to say, you're more, you're more. Listen to me, my darling, listen to me. It starts tapping on the shoulder. Listen to me, my darling. And sometimes that tap gets bigger and louder and harder. And we get what some people will call that spiritual two by four upside the head. And that's what wakes us up. So this awakening is part of that wholeness paradigm. So you and I are a blessing to the world. You are a blessing to the world. Now, do you love yourself enough to actually live as a blessing to the world? Do you consider yourself whole enough to bless this world? You know, the beauty and the simplicity of what we teach here, two ideas, just two ideas. God is all there is. It is done unto us as we believe. So if we were believing that God isn't all there is, we're going to start living that way. Makes sense to me. Is that pretty simple? Okay. And if God is all there is, that means that you and I live and move and have our being in that. And by the way, and this is the thing that I don't hear enough of, we live and move and have our being in God, but guess what? God lives and moves and has its being in us, by means of us, through us. And that's that gold. That as we begin to chip away those old beliefs, those fears, those suspicions that we might have grown up with. You know, our culture dwells so much in this realm of what we call here duality, God and something else. You know, we tend, we want to believe and live as if God is there and that God is good, but Likely, there might be something getting in the way if we are not living as full and robust a life as we really want to live. You know, our, if we're not constantly feeling and expressing that level of good we would like. So what is it that is getting in the way? That's what we like to ask. That's the question that we ask all the time. And it's an ongoing journey, and we go deeper, we go deeper, we go deeper, and, and we learn more and more and more. And every time we think we've gotten to the core of that onion, there's still more to be revealed. So what is it for you? Some of us grew up with the devil. Some of you grew up with cranky God. 
Um, and some of you grow up, grew up with what uh, Dr. Mark likes to say, the combination guard, God, which is part bellhop, part Santa Claus, and part hitman. <laughs> I think that's most of us, right? But no wonder our lives are not always what we dreamed they would be. We have a God who is unreliable and apparently allows an oppositional force, according to how we were raised, that wants to screw everything up just when we think it's going to work out. Very passive-aggressive God, don't you think? So let's look at those statements. God is all there is, is the first one. And the second one is, it done unto me as I believe. So if you and I are believing that God isn't fully blessing, fully loving, fully, fully revealing itself, herself, himself, by means of us, by means of the ideas that we have, by means of the lives we live, then we are going to be in pain. We're going to be in pain. And sometimes that's the quickest way to reveal that light is to question why is there pain? Where is there pain? How is this pain informing me of a good that wants to emerge? What am I denying? What is the light that I'm trying to cover that is so bright within me that it actually burns me with the pain of trying to cover it? What if you and I dare to change and redirect the fundamental nature about God? What if we went beyond passive aggressive, moody, cranky God who apparently is up sitting in the sky, as I like to say, with a list and has fallen off his anger meds? What if we had a different God? If we dare to conceive of this infinite source and substance that's indeed whole and not damaged, which means you and I are damaged, we are whole, Ah, wouldn't it be nice to know God is not working out its issues through you and me? I mean, seriously. You know, we think that God's got some issues that need to just be worked out through us. God's got karma that has to be worked out through us, as opposed to knowing that we were born with our eyes wide open. We are born in original blessing. Not original sin, original blessing. Matthew Fox has a book that I'm reading right now called Original Blessing. And this is the knowing that we, we didn't come from some sin, some weakness, some fear, some, some need to, to get even or to make up for somebody else's mistake. We, and don't even get me started on the Garden of Eden. Don't, don't, we will not talk about Adam and Eve today. That's another talk. But that, God is not working out its stuff through us. God doesn't need to. God is whole, perfect, and complete, and you and I are as well. Ernest Holmes wrote, We are made of eternal stuff fashioned after a divine pattern. Divine pattern. Eternal stuff. We are made of that. So some of you know that my favorite verse in the Bible is from Peter's second epistle to the Philippians. And this one, the first time I heard it, I fell off my chair. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God. Equal to God. You and I are equal to God. Let this mind be in us. Let us inhabit this idea, this this. Oh, this, I, this concept, this life, this identity that we are equal to God. In other words, that which is true about God, that power, that presence, that infinite wholeness, that infinite good, that supply, that source, all of that stuff, you and I are already that. Yes, it sounds blasphemous. Did you know I have not yet been struck by lightning? <laughs> Nor have you. Nor have you. One of the things that we say in this teaching is that when we have revealed our, our understanding to a specific idea that we desire to experience and express in our world, be it a relationship, um, a, a creative job, something like that, or perhaps abundant supply, that when it begins to show forth in our experience, we call that a demonstration. We do the work in consciousness to get there. We do the spiritual work. We study, we learn, we support that, we pray, we meditate, we work with other people. We surround ourselves with people who will support us in that idea of our own light and our divinity. So, Picture for a moment that that's how we demonstrate you and I are God's demonstration. God did all that work and demonstrated us. How's that? God was already actually 
at that level of consciousness, and we are the demonstration. We are the result of that wholeness, the result of that power and that presence. It's very easy to get inundated with the media and with stories of stuff going out in the world and to think that that's how life really is, that we think that's what God is doing, that's how it is. And there's a line from the Talmud, unhappy conditions arise when we mistake shadow for substance. <laughs> Are you mistaking shadow for substance? Isn't that something? we begin to look at it and say, well, that must be the truth. And it's not. In fact, I have a, um, an anagram of, for the word fact, F-A-C-T, fluid assessment of a current trend. Because facts change. You know, the, the construction crew believed it was a fact that that 350 foot tall Buddha was made from clay and mud. The fact was that it was made from gold solid gold. Facts change. So a full knowing of God as presence and power includes the idea that since God is all there is, then God is both source and substance. But when we accept somebody else's perceptions of who we are, or how life is, or what our possibilities might be, be the creative, um, manifest, cre creative manifestations or relationship or whatever it is that you desire to experience in your world, if we accept somebody else's limitations, mm, then we will, of course, have the experience of a world gone crazy. That's what is meant by the Talmud's idea of don't mistake shadow for substance. Ernest Holmes wrote that the universe holds nothing against us. So no matter what it is, where you've come from, what you've done, or you think you've done, or whatever your belief has told you or somebody else told you, the universe doesn't hold that memory. You and I do. Universe isn't keeping score. That's kind of a good thing to hear, isn't it? That's good news. We forget that there's more to us than that. The wholeness paradigm tells us that we are more than that. The wholeness paradigm tells us that we are here to live from this largeness, this, this big, beautiful idea of possibility. I'm looking for one of my quotes, which I may find, or I may not. There it is. So Howard Thurman is one of my favorite authors, and he was one of the teachers who taught Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And he wrote this, don't and actually he spoke this, it was a, a talk that he gave, a, a, a speech at Spelman College in 1980. And as a black man, he was a very powerful, but not, not attended to and regarded man in 1980. And we have begun to honor the teaching that he offered. And there's so much richness there, so much juiciness. And he said, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. The world needs people who have come alive. The world needs people who don't look out here for that, that inspiration, but they begin to go in here and say, what is the idea that God has within me to change the world, to save the world, to transform the world, to transform myself. There's a, um, a prayer that I'm going to paraphrase from Course in Miracles, which is, and it's in the idea is that we ask this every day, spirit, what am I to do? Where am I to go? What am I to say and to whom? And it's, it's part of my meditative practice to ask those questions so that I open myself to a realization that, that there is that which is within me which is greater than who and what I am. Thou art that which I am, I am that which thou art. That's part of the, the process that I go through. So, you know, spirit, today, Sunday, I woke up thinking, what is, what's mine to do? Where am I to go? What am I to say and to whom? And then I looked at my phone thinking, first of all, that I was gonna have a lazy morning of coffee and catching up on Facebook posts and what have you, and sure enough, there's a text from Dr. Mark saying, you know, I'm under the weather. I need you to speak today. Okay, what am I to say and to whom? <laughs> you know, his talk title was A New Look, and 
I think that whenever we are willing to take a new look, a brand new look at who we are, how we are, what we are, and exfoliate the dust of the world, the grit from the journey, let that go, that light will always tell us who we are. That light will always tell us who we are and where to go and what to do. And yet it's so much easier to claim armor and protection, right? We want armor, we want protection, we want, we want to know that it's going to be safe, it's going to be okay. We don't necessarily, we want, the, we want the vitality and the energy and excitement that comes from living on the edge, but we don't actually want to step up to the edge. You know, we'd rather do it back here from the comfort of this chair, but life doesn't work that way. Life really doesn't work that way. We must be willing to remove the armor and the protection and to go to solid truth. There is one life. That life is God. That life is perfect. That life is my life now. That life is your life now. That's all there is. It's God. In fact, I was looking at a, a quote from Ernest Holmes in a book called It's Up to You. And he wrote this. And for those of you playing our home game, this is on page 45. We have been so afraid of mentioning the word God, so superstitious about everything concerning the deity, that the thought of ourselves as divine has been foreign to the general conception. But we have to face facts. We must be honest in our investigation if we are to get anywhere. If there's anything that we need to know, it is this, that the eternal is incarnated in each one of us, that God himself or itself or herself, whatever works for you, goes forth anew into creation through each one of us. And in such degree as we speak the truth, the Almighty has spoken. The Almighty has spoken. This is why we talk so much about our word. Our word. You know, when we speak our word and we do it with conviction, with feeling, with emotion, we activate spiritual law. Now, the issue is, though, many a time, we will, many a time, that sounds very provincial, many a time, Many times we will activate this law with our words saying, oh, that's going to be horrible. Or I'm, 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 I just, I'm not going to like that. Or, oh, they'll never like me. Or, and that activates spiritual law as well because the universe doesn't hold that record, doesn't keep that score, right? It just responds. So when we choose to do, as Howard Thurman said, to ask what makes us come alive, the law responds to that as well. When we choose to let go of the armor and the protection and be vulnerable to life, then we move in great power. We move in great power. So this, for many of us, will look like we have to speak love to our fear and our anger. We have to live into a vision of speaking love into somebody else's fear and anger. Sometimes I'll go to the Bible for wisdom. You know, the stories in the Bible, and they are stories, they're allegories, about somebody getting into trouble, using truth, and then getting out of trouble, which is pretty much how we live, right? We get ourselves into a jam, or we find ourselves in an experience of pain or loss or something like that, and we have to remember the truth. We, we find the way to, to open ourselves to inspiration, to solution, to a greater idea, to remember that we are divine. We are divine in form. And then we transcend the issue. So one of the stories I like is David and Goliath. Now, what's interesting about this is that Goliath... So we, we've heard the story, right? Goliath, this big old monster. You know, think Chewbacca, only on steroids. Um, so in the Bible, six cubits and a span. Uh, not a spam, a span. Spam is something different. Six cubits and a span. Now, I, I, I don't do Bible math. I'll do minister math, which is, are these heels too high for me to walk in? That's because, you know, ministry is all about the shoes. You've heard me say that. But six cubits in a span. And... So with a chain mail coat, which had the weight of 5,000 shekels of brass, shekels, 
just, it was a lot. So Goliath, this monster covered in chain mail. And if you've seen Outlander or any fantasies, you know chain mail is like that which protects you, totally protects you. So he threatened and bullied the Israelites for 40 days. And by the way, in the Bible, 40, the number 40, especially if you see 40 days, means as long as it takes. That is the metaphysical of that, 40 as long as it takes. Jesus, 40 days, 40 nights in the desert, right? 40 years for the, Israel, the Israelites trying to find a home in the desert, as long as it takes. Someone's backing up. Um, no, never back up from life, always go forward. Okay, so and here it was. The, so bullied and, and, and yelled at the Israelites for 40 days and said things like, you're fat, you're old, you're stupid, your mother wears army boots. I have all the best words, I'm Bigly, you have a horse face. I don't know, whatever it was. This, this bully, anybody ever feel bullied? How about from your own thoughts? How about your own thoughts that are like coming at you, coming at you like out of a cannon, telling you how unworthy you are? Now David, and David by the way means beloved, the beloved, David was the one who was called on to go forth to slay Goliath. Now he, he went out first with a whole bunch of armor, but he couldn't move, he couldn't lift his arms, and he couldn't see. So he had to rely on principle. He had to rely on truth, on the divine that he was. He couldn't put the mud over the gold because it wasn't going to work that way. So in the Bible it says no one can wear another's armor. So he could not. So what he did was he took five smooth pebbles and a slingshot. Now, in the Bible, whenever you see a reference to pebbles or to stones, that means truth. Stones represent solid truth. So what he did was he slung pure truth, pure truth at the center of Goliath's head, the intellect, so he spoke love to fear. He spoke truth to anger. He slayed the dragon by not accepting that the armor was bigger than the truth, by not saying there's no gold under that mud. He just simply spoke truth. He didn't argue with conditions, which is what we do, don't we? we how can this be going on? This can't be right, this can't be right. Normal human reaction, but until we move past that, and go to solid truth and say, there is only God. And that which is within me is greater and far more golden than that which is in the world. And that's what he did. He took these stones and he slung them at, at Goliath's forehead right there, right there, the center of intellect. Because love, spiritual truth, are greater than intellectual process. There's nothing wrong with having a wonderful mind. In fact, the fact that we all have these incredible minds that are microcosms of that infinite divine mind, that's awesome and that's as it should be. However, when all we're doing is living from the logic and intellect, then we are no longer surrounding that with truth. And when we have them both together, then we are truly, truly in a position where we can ask, what is it that makes me come alive? How can I go out into the world and celebrate that and change the world and be that and interpret the divine by way of Sydney, by way of Mark, by way of any of us? There's this power of truth. There's a power in truth. And when we tell the truth, capital T truth, to that which we thought was the truth, the little t truth, <sighs> wow, we are free. It does indeed set us free. The gold of the Buddha was set free from the dust, the clay, that which was hard, and it came forth and shined and inspired. You know, in martial arts, there isn't, you don't fight energy, 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 you transmute the energy, right? You transform it, you transmute it, it might be coming at you and you transmute it, you assimilate and it converts. And that's what we as beings of the divine 
get to do. We get to transmute the energy that is God, that we already are, into the radiance, the brilliance, whatever it is that makes us come alive. And that's how you and I will change the world. That's how you and I will live from a higher place, from a more beautiful, inspired, wonderful, loving, happy, joyful place, remembering once again that right where we are, God is right where you are, right where I am, that the truth of who and what we are is infinite. And nothing, nothing, and no one can stand in the way of that, including you. Let's pray. So we take this idea in of I am the divine. I am that. Thou art which I am. Thou art which I am. I am that which thou art, recognizing that God is all. That presence, that glorious organized design, whether we call it spirit, infinite life, universal presence, God is all there is, which means we are surrounded, filled, saturated by and as God. So we step forth in this knowing today willing to recognize and accept that that which is within is absolutely greater than any belief, any perception, anything which we might have chosen to think was true for us in the world. And we speak our word for joy. We speak our word for wholeness, demonstrating in any and every area of life, because that is the fullness of God. That is the fullness of the divine expression. And we are worthy. So I know that for each of us, we go forth this day and we speak truth to fear. We, tr we speak love to anger. And we recognize that there is only one power and one presence and it is flowing through all life and that nothing and no one can stand in opposition to that which is infinite love. And how glorious it is to recognize and know that we, we speak our word as well. That we live as that word of power, of gold. And that everyone for whom we, oh, have a connection, with whom we have a connection, is also God. And it's from that, that innate oneness, that universal oneness, that I know that as we move through our day, as we leave this place today, we are a blessing to ourselves and to the world. And indeed, there is a shift. There is an uplift because it can be no other way. One with God as a majority, and holy cow, we got about 80 people in here. So we are speaking the truth. We are speaking truth, we are living truth, we are demonstrating truth, and we are willing to be that truth in action. So I bless this church. I bless all churches everywhere, all paths to God, all ashrams, all synagogues, all mosques, all temples, whatever that particular oh, building or path looks like. All of those people, we bless them because all are on their journey to knowing more, to loving more, to being more. And that is the truth. So knowing it is so, I accept this in profound gratitude. And I know for all of us that we cultivate gratitude this day. We live in it, we move in it, we celebrate it. And we release this word knowing it is already so, and together we say, Amen. I am so blessed. I am so And so would you say with me as you take your gift in your hand, your tithe, your love offering, and hold it to your heart, this love organ, 
Say this with me, if you will. From the love of pure spirit, I bless this gift. I set it forth to heal, to bless, and to prosper. It is evidence of my faith and belief. It does good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly. Thank you, God.
Wow. Joy Burnworth Weiner. Give it up. That was wonderful. Um, for, where's my glasses? I can't see. For Joy's music, you can find her on soundcloud.com forward slash joy slash Burnworth. So that's soundcloud.com forward slash joy dash Burnworth. You were wonderful. Thank you so very much. And of course, where would we be without Sam Krieger and Karen Smith? I almost said Sam and Diane because it just seems to go together. <laughs> OK, so, so um, announcements for today, ways you can make donations. Call the office, 818-762-7566, or go to, or go to um, nhcrs.org forward slash give or text the word GIVE to 818-457-3419. Also, you can shop Amazon Smile and select Our Church, which is Church of Religious Science North Hollywood, as the charity of your choice. It's so simple, and they remind you when you go to make a purchase, did you want to go to here? Um, and this benefits the church at no cost to any of us. Um, <clears throat> prayer with a practitioner. After service, we're back to prayer, yay, in person with people. So we have prayer with a practitioner or on Zoom. If you're at home, we can pray with you via Zoom. Um, email prayer requests to prayer at nhcrs.org or put a request in the prayer box in the back um, or call in your prayer request to church office, option number four. Let's see, what else do we have here? Okay, Wednesday evening service uh, with Reverend Sydney, you are on, you're busy this week. Um, meditation is at 6.50 and the service is at seven o'clock and Reverend Sydney's topic this week is ready, willing, and able. And clearly she demonstrated that today. <laughs> so yes, right? Girl rocked it. So, Youth Church is open. We welcome youth of all ages to church at our 9.45 a.m. service. We have Circle of Healing today at 11.30 a.m. in the sanctuary, and we're going to join practitioner Mary Catherine O'Hart as she gently guides us via chakras in a loving healing experience. So hopefully you'll stay for that. We have Feeding the Homeless. Our love and kindness ministry is Feeding the Homeless today, and to support this ministry, go to our website, Volunteers and donations are always welcome. Living a Course of Miracles on Zoom. This group is facilitated by practitioner Jeannie Laporte, and it meets Thursday, October 21st, from 7.15 to 9.15 on Zoom. We also have something fun and social, free spooktacular movie night, Friday, October 29th, 7 to 10 p.m. Join us for a screening of the movie Young Frankenstein, followed by treats on the patio, and there will be a costume contest, so please dress up. I have to tell you that we are so excited, and we have prizes for costumes, so you know, call, call forth all of that creative energy within that's been kind of buried the last year and a half due to COVID, and put those costumes on, because I, I gotta tell you, I'm the one getting all the prizes, and I'm having the best time, so. <laughs> And, and we will do the, um, the movie here in the spooktuary. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you do, um, first of all, you have to come in person to win. You cannot dress up via Zoom, so get your booty on the floor and be here. Okay, <clears> hope <throat> Dr. Mark's not listening. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> So um, also, uh, practitioner Sabrina Johnson's meditation series is postponed for now TBD. So we'll let you know about that. We're also looking for people to help host our services on Facebook Live. It's relatively easy, a lot of fun. And if you're interested, just call the church office because we could really use your support in that area. The bookstore is open for 30 minutes after service every Sunday. So please stop by. Who's in the bookstore today? Oh, okay, great, Carrie's in there. So go visit Carrie. And then uh, Zoom virtual patio before and after Sunday and Wednesday services. So that just means you can stay on Zoom and someone will chit chat with you. And um, we also have a Zoom meditation 
every Monday through Saturday at 8 a.m. So if you want to um, connect through in, in our community from home, um, <clears throat> Sunday, what is it, what did I say? It was Monday through Saturday at 8 o'clock in the morning. Visit our website, nhcrs.org, to obtain Zoom links and more information about all our events. Sign up for weekly e-blasts and monthly newsletters. And I believe that is it. So let's rise and sing the peace song together. In truth. My life is anchored in truth. I can never be separate. I, can never be separate. I, live, in I live in the consciousness of peace. I release all fear. I, release all fear. I, am, living I am living love. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 